Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 17. Very key chapter as we move through this very exciting book, which gives to us a great deal of information about the early church. And uh, very interesting as we look at the principles that we discover as we view Paul's missionary journeys and as we see the methods that he uses in reaching people, especially among Gentiles and pagans uh, who are lost, reaching them for Christ. Because, of course, what we're surrounded by primarily are Gentiles and pagans. And so I think we can learn much from what we see the Apostle Paul doing. Tonight we're talking about general revelation and common grace. And as I mentioned this morning, that is a contentious issue in many Reformed circles, not so much among Bible Presbyterians, but many in the Reformed camp actually deny that there is any such thing as common grace. We're also going to see that there is an extreme on the far end among the Arminians who talk about common grace but don't mean by it the same thing that you and I would mean by it. And so tonight, hopefully we can clear up some of those issues by looking at what the Apostle Paul preaches here as he is speaking to pagans, talking to individuals who actually are accountable before God and who reveal through the writings of some of their poets the fact that they knew certain things about God. I'm going to start reading in verse 24. We'll read down through verse 29. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, neither dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that tonight as we look into this passage, you might truly show us that you are the living God. Uh, you're not a created God. You're not a demigod. You're not a, a minor God. You're not some kind of a demonic force out there that masquerades as God. You are the God, the true and living God. And Father, we pray for your blessings upon your word as it goes forth tonight, that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall that last time we were together in Acts was back on March 1st. And that seems like a long time ago. It really does, especially with Palm Sunday and Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday coming up right over the brow of the hill. Uh, hard to believe that it's coming that quickly, but we talked about the one blood. I read that portion tonight because that's what moves us into our text for tonight. We studied the reasons and showed how they are related to the issue that we saw in the morning messages where Moses turned the, or God through Moses and Aaron turned the river of the Nile into blood. We studied the reasons that the first plague that God sent on Egypt was the plague of blood, and we talked about that again this morning. We saw the four reasons given in Scripture. First, the Nile was the principal god of Egypt, and God was smiting that god. Uh, Egypt considered the Nile god, the river uh, god, to be the source of life, and God demonstrated that he was the one who created life, and that that was a dead god. He made it die and everything stink in the river. You cannot trust anything but the living God to give you life. And so... That was the attack against the River Nile. And Paul here is talking about the one blood of all nations, and we saw how that related to the second basic reason that God gave the uh, plague of blood back in the book of Exodus was because the location of life is in the blood. God puts it into the blood, and God sustains it in the blood. The blood by itself does not have life but God put it there and sustained it there, and we saw that in Leviticus 17.11 and many other uh, places as well. And then third, the blood, which is the vessel of life, is required to make an atonement for sin, and God made that very, very clear. Uh, dead blood, infected blood, cannot make an atonement for the soul. Only pure living blood could do that. Pharaoh worshipped the Nile, but his source of life was dead. 
Then fourth, we saw that the plague of blood is a portent of future judgment on the world. We saw the striking parallel with the book of Revelation. I gave you some of that this morning again, where blood is mentioned 17 times, seven of which are related to specific judgments, just like the seven days of plague of blood from Moses. And that's all tied together in that statement in Acts 17, where Paul talks about all nations being made of one blood. We have the vantage point of looking back at the cross, where a true God became true man through the virgin birth. Then Jesus took on flesh, and it was real flesh, supported like all the rest of us with real human blood. The shedding of human blood through murder or by animal attack is a violation of the one principal aspect of the creation of man. Man is made in the image of God. However, there was an important difference that we studied that was between us and the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is that Christ was sinless, and therefore his blood did not corrupt like our blood. And we pointed out various passages, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, which state that. Psalm 16:10, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence of fullness of joy at thy right hand are the pleasures forevermore. And we noted that both Peter and Paul in the New Testament quote Psalm 16 and quote that prophecy, uh, presenting the superiority and the uniqueness of our Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter's Sermon on the Day of Pentecost, which is foundational, of course, to the opening of the church age, he quotes Psalm 16 twice. Uh, down in verse 25, for David speaketh concerning him, and then he begins to quote the psalm. Verse 27, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. That's a very important part of that psalm, and Peter quotes it in Acts on the day of Pentecost. And then he makes it a real point out of that in verse 29, where he says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us today. That's a contrast between Christ, who saw no corruption, and David. Even the great David was a sinner. When he died, his blood decayed, his body rotted away. And then down there again in verse 31, just two verses later, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. A real major point uh, about the difference between Christ, who, though he bore our sins, was sinless, and therefore, he did not see corruption, even though he was dead for three days. And you know that corruption would have set in during that period of time from John chapter 11, where Jesus says, take away the stone from Lazarus' tomb. And Martha says to him, Lord, he's been dead four days, and by this time he stinketh. They understood what death and corruption was about. But Jesus, though he was three days and three nights in the tomb, saw no corruption. Very important point to remember that though he was a true man, Though he had real life support through the blood system, he shed his blood for our sins. He was not some kind of an automaton, a bloodless thing out there. He was truly human, and we are called his brethren. We're physically related to him all the way back to Noah or to Adam, both uh, through both of them. Uh, Adam's the first Adam, through which we inherit our sin nature. Christ is the second Adam, by whom we are redeemed, not only from our own sins, but from the sin of Adam and the curse that he brought on the human race. So it's very important that we understand that principle related to corruption. The rest of humanity will also be raised from the dead, but all of us, if we die, are going to go through a state of corruption, including the rich. And we talked about that in Psalm uh, 49 and uh, talked a little bit about cryogenics, which is not the uh, answer to it, because that's the quick freezing of the body, hoping that science will someday come up with a, a solution for death. They won't. <clears throat> it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. We see that truth that will all rot as the blood decays in the New Testament chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. So is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. That's the state of all humanity because of the sin of Adam, except for Christ. That is part of the great curse that was placed on all of the creation, including the animals because of Adam's sin. It goes back to Genesis. Genesis is foundational and the only explanation is why things happen the way that they do. Now, I gave you all that very quick summary from three weeks ago because that's the foundation for Paul's statement in Acts 17 where he points back to the Creator God, the first Creator of all things, and then to our text tonight where one of the distinct characteristics of the physical body of man, his blood, is also tied in 
with the foundation for common grace, which is, which, is, which is what is in our text tonight. And you'll see that a little bit more clearly as we go on. So down in verse 27 and following, after he said, we're all of one blood, and he's made the nations to dwell in these particular locations on the face of the earth, that they should seek the Lord. That is immediately what follows. It's, it's the conclusion that Paul says, this is the obvious logical conclusion, because he's made us of one blood, even though we're dwelling in different places on the earth, so that we would seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. And he's quoting in those two phrases uh, some poets that I'll talk about in a moment. For in him we live and move and have our being, and for we are his also his offspring. And then verse 29, his conclusion, if you admit that premise, says the Apostle Paul, a premise which your, post, your own poets already know, in other words, there is some revelation, general revelation that your poets knew about and they gave it to you in your poetry and you've accepted what they've said. If you admit that, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. You start with certain premises, you must reach certain conclusions if you are logically consistent. Paul has marvelous argumentation. In fact, the book of Romans has often been used in uh, seminaries and in Christian colleges to teach logic. Uh, going through Romans, as the Apostle Paul works his way through, he uses very precise and very tight logic, logical argumentation. And he's using it here as he preaches in Acts chapter 17. Now, let me give you a little introduction about common grace. <clears throat> the issue of common grace, as I stated, is hotly debated in certain Reformed circles with those who adamantly assert that grace is only for the elect. Now, that sounds good, and that's what they say. Grace is only for the elect, therefore there is not common grace. Then there are others, which is the middle position, which is the position that I assert, that there are certain aspects of grace that God has extended to all men everywhere, things which actually benefit, benefit the reprobate pagans, extend blessings to them, provide for them, make their lives better and easier, and give greater opportunity for them to hear to understand and believe the gospel, even if they never will believe, because they are not elect. They start dead, and just because they have the opportunity doesn't mean that they somehow have the innate ability to do it. But let me also state at the outset how I'm defining common grace. There is not only the hyper-reformed position that says God has only extended grace to the elect, but there is also on the opposite side the unbiblical Arminian position. I do not mean the Arminian view of common grace. That's not what I'm talking about tonight. Arminian view of common grace asserts that all men at birth are so wrought upon by the Holy Spirit that they are rendered capable of an unhindered response to the gospel invitation. But we need to remember the unregenerate man is dead in his trespasses and sins. He's not sick in his trespasses and sins. Uh, struggling and gasping for air, and suddenly when he gets the gasp of air, he believes. He's dead in his trespasses and sins. Without the external work of the Spirit of God on his heart, through the Word of God, not only will he not believe, but he is incapable of believing. It's very important. Three different positions on common grace. Don't let anybody confuse you on it. There's the hyper-Calvinist position that says, God doesn't give any grace at all of any kind, anywhere, anytime, to anybody except the elect. There's the Armenian position that says, common grace means that anybody can and will believe just by his own volition and choice, and he's alive enough to be able to do it. There's the middle position that says, no, only the elect will believe, and we agree with the what would be called the hyper-reform position, but we disagree with the Arminians, because they say that man's alive enough to be able to believe. But we also say that there are certain aspects of grace, and we'll look at verses that deal with that tonight, certain aspects of grace that actually extend to the reprobate, <clears throat> and in fact, which we are exhorted to model. The Lord Jesus actually exhorts us to model that type of grace to people around us, even if they are not among the elect. 
And so we'll be looking at some of those passages, the Lord willing, tonight. Now, remember our context. I, I gave you this last week a little bit, just so you'll, you'll click it together with this business of one blood and the common grace issue. Because we're one blood with the non-elect out there also. We're all descended from Noah. We're all descended from Adam. God has reached down and saved some of us and has chosen not to. He's passed over others. But remember, Paul is the one who's preaching this message. That's a man who was a super holy, super ancestor conscious, super I am proud of my bloodline from the tribe of Benjamin Jew. And he's preaching to a mixed bag of Greeks with no Jewish blood at all. Paul knew his own bloodline. In fact, he makes a point of that in the book of Galatians and in the book of Romans. The Jews considered themselves better than the Gentiles because they were a pure race. They weren't a mixed breed. They were descended from Abraham. They were the ones chosen by God. They were the ones who had the covenant with God. They didn't mix their blood with the other nations. They didn't drink blood. They were superior separatists. But suddenly, Paul as we see in our text tonight, begins to not only understand but to proclaim the implications that that has for all of mankind, which is how we get into this issue of common grace here. How the implications of that one blood for all mankind affects what God has done for everybody not just the elect nation of the Jews, and thus not merely for the individual elect that are being called out of every tribe and nation of the Gentiles. The astounding and overwhelming reach of this is what I am calling tonight common grace. Now, hopefully, I hope you remember the messages that I brought in the morning worship service about a month ago on the real humanity of Christ, how we're all genetically related to Christ through Noah and Adam. Jesus was really human. He was really human. He was not an angel. He was not a phantasm. The angel business, I mean, the Mormons believe that Jesus was some kind of an angel. Uh, he wasn't a phantasm. He wasn't some kind of a, a ghost thing like the Gnostics would hold. He was not a humanoid-like creature that appeared to be a man. And that's what the connection we're trying to make here. That's why Paul's statement and application of common grace is so powerful. Let's look at the passage a phrase at a time. Verse 27, first, first phrase in it. That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him. Now, that is the immediate phrase after we're told that God made all humans with the same blood and put them in different places on the earth. Here in this phrase, we are told the reason that because God has made of one blood all nations for to dwell on the face of the earth, which is the scientific fact, and we talked about some of the science that underlies that one blood relationship, you can't get a transfusion of you know, ostrich blood. It, it can be an Eskimo woman. It can be a, a South African Hottentot. I mean, it can be people from all over the earth because we're just one blood but in different locations. That's what he's just talked about. But you can't have a parrot blood, for example, for a transfusion. We have a parrot lover down here in the front. Uh, it's human blood, one blood of all nations. That's the reason, a scientific fact. that This is one mechanism that God has given to man to realize that there is a God whom he should seek. You know, that's really the basis of creationism, too, and the basis of what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 1. God has given the light of creation, and we'll be talking about that a little more in a moment. God has given the light of creation so that men will know God's eternal power and his Godhead so that they are without excuse. Science was designed by God. As we look at creation around us, we can look through the telescope, we can look through the microscope, we can look with our bare eyeballs and see that there is evidence for God. That's why twice in the Psalms it says, the fool I said in his heart, there is no God. Only someone who, as Paul calls it, who suppresses the truth in unrighteousness in the book of Romans. He has to suppress the truth because God has revealed himself through creation. That's the point that Paul's making here. And that ties to common grace. God has given us enough evidence to know that he is there. He's given us enough evidence to know what kind of a God he is. 
We can learn certain things about his power, and we can learn certain things about his Godhead. Very important word. It's a word that refers to the Trinity by studying what God has created. And unregenerates can study it too. And unregenerates can come to scientific conclusions and make genuine, real discoveries. They may apply it wrong, but they can actually study science and learn things, as many of them do, although they harden their hearts and they suppress the truth as to what or to whom that is pointing. Let me give you a couple of other <clears throat> passages that deal with common grace. This is out of Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 43. Jesus is speaking. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Hey, that's uh, pretty common today, too, isn't it? Yeah, we, we love the people that we like, and we sure hate our enemies out there. You know, I suspect if we took a um, poll among Christians at large here in the United States, how many of you all hated Osama bin Laden? How many of you all hate the Iranians? When you know that they're in the midst of developing nuclear warheads targeted at the United States. How many of you all hate Hitler? You know, it, it gets kind of personal, doesn't it? How many of you all hate the guy who just beat you out of that promotion and you, in fact, got either part time or laid off? You hate his guts. <laughs> You've heard that it has been said. Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But Jesus says, I say unto you, love your enemies. You're going to exercise some grace toward an enemy. That goes against human nature, doesn't it? You know something? The reason God tells us that is because human nature is tainted by sin, isn't it? God doesn't have human nature that's tainted by sin. Jesus it was really human, had a real human nature, but it wasn't tainted by sin. And so he approaches things a little differently. And we need to remember that when we're studying the issue of common grace, because otherwise we're going to miss the connection between how common grace, which God gives even to those who are his enemies, is supposed to be reflected in the lives of believers. And he's going to talk about common grace in a second, but he first starts with how we're supposed to be reflecting our Heavenly Father. And then he's going to tell us that's because your Father exercises common grace. Let me read it on here. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And that's not just praying imprecatory prayers. Now, we read in the Psalms, David prayed some imprecatory prayers, and that means he's praying against his enemies. Yeah. He's saying, Lord, stop them from hurting me. You know, wipe them off the face of the earth. I'm really tired from running. But Jesus says, pray for them, which despitefully use you and persecute you. Reason, verse 45, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Children usually manifest certain characteristics of their parents, don't they? I mean, they manifest physical characteristics, right? Most people's kids sort of look like them. I mean, something in that kid looks like the parents. Some of them have personalities like their parents, sometimes for good and sometimes for bad. Some of them more strongly resemble their mom and some more strongly resemble their dad. And some of them have musical abilities and some of them don't. And there might be, as you look back in the genetic line, that there are others who really had the same kind of qualities. Children are supposed to be like their parents. Well, we have one Heavenly Father, and He's perfect. And we're supposed to be modeling Him. And that's what Jesus says, that you may be children of your Father which is in heaven. Now here it is, common grace. For He maketh His Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Now I heard a, a little poem of sorts years ago. It says, yeah, yeah, 
God sends his rain on the just fella and on the unjust fella, but more on the just fella because the unjust steals the just umbrella. <laughs> yes. Okay, but he still sends his rain, doesn't he? On the unjust as well as the just. He still makes that guy's crops to grow. He still causes the sun to rise in the morning, and it not only shines on the man who is the believer, but the sun rises in the morning and it gives light for the unbeliever to go to work and maybe even to embezzle that day. That's common grace. God is being good and beneficial to people who will end up in hell. That's common grace. And it goes back to the fact that we're of one blood and it gives us future command that that's how we are supposed to be. Where we are to love our enemies and bless them that curse you and do good to them that hate you. Do evil people curse God? Yes. Does he still treat them well? Yes. Do evil people do evil things against God? If you look around American society, if you look around the world right now where Christians are being murdered, yes. Does he still make the sun rise on those people every morning? Their clocks still work? Yes. He still lets them breathe every day? Yes. They still have food to eat? In fact, David you know, questions that in the Psalms. He says, you know, it, it bothers me that, that God actually provides for the children of the evil man. And he, he lives a long age and his, his children are fat and flourishing. You see, that's the character of God. That's what we're dealing with when we're dealing with common grace. And Jesus goes on in verse 46, <clears throat> For if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? In other words, you criticize the publicans, but hey, the publicans, you're, you're imitating the publicans when you only like the people that like you. And then verse 48, which summarizes it, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Teleos, mature, complete. Seeing all sides of the picture from the divine viewpoint, not merely seeing it from the very limited and, and warped human viewpoint. In other words, just like God commands you to do good to your enemies, he does good to his enemies by the gracious acts provided through creation. And that's why we do it to mirror him. The Apostle Paul makes reference to that same kind of principle of common grace over in Acts 14. We studied it in detail, but I didn't hit that issue hard at that time because of what Paul is saying here in Acts chapter 17, which sort of ties it all together with the fact that we are all of one blood, just different locations on the face of the earth, and it goes back to how God creates, uh, treats his creation. Acts chapter 14. Starting in verse 11. When the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lacaonia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was a chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before the city, brought oxen and garlands under the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. Now listen, do we have a group of pagans here? How many of you think we have a group of pagans here that Paul's preaching to? Are these guys pagans? Yeah! The priest of Jupiter, they're trying to worship Paul and Barnabas. These guys are not saved, right? Greed? Yes. These are the guys that are going to stone Paul in just a little bit? Yeah. Probably not going to be very many of them among the elect? Yeah. Now listen to what he says. They would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles Paul and Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. These are the nations spread out on the face of the earth. He's talking about the same group over there in Acts chapter 17. Now look at verse 17. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. 
Could they relate to that? I think so. Yes. He gave rain from heaven to them? Yes. Did he give them some fruitful seasons? Yes. Did he fill their hearts with food and gladness? Is there any happiness or joy that sometimes comes to unbelievers around you? Do they have exciting things in their life that they're thankful about, that they're thrilled? They don't know who they're thanking. They, they attribute it to luck or something else or maybe to their own skills. But do they get happy? Yeah, yeah, sure do. It's not the, the pagans all around you that you see always sad and gloomy, although Christians sometimes are sad and gloomy, though we shouldn't be. We should be filled with joy, not necessarily happiness. Happiness relates to happenstance or happenings, circumstances. Joy relates to the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts in spite of circumstances. But has God done good through creation to the world, to even the pagans? I think so. Paul is saying so here. Then verse 27b, the second part of verse 27. Here's our next phrase. Though he be not far from every one of us. Is God only near believers? No. He's not merely transcendent, he's imminent. That means that he is here. He became one of us. That's what Emmanuel means, God with us. Though he be not far from every one of us, that means that God is close. That means that God is knowable. God is not hiding. The character of God is visible through the creation that we can all see around us. This is certainly common grace that God has given to all men to make them accountable for knowing him. Now in the book of Romans, Paul gives three different aspects of common grace that is extended to all men. And I've preached on it in some detail in the past, so I'll only summarize it here. But remember, these three things are really common grace given to all men. Romans chapter 1 is the light of creation, which is what I've given you several illustrations of here uh, for just a moment. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Romans 1, 18 and following. It says, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Creation reveals God. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And then he goes into the big list of how they changed, you know, they started worshiping animals and creatures and other things instead of the true God. And so God gave them over, and three times it says he gave them over to their own lusts, and then we move into that horrible passage dealing with, with sodomy and lesbianism. So chapter 1 of Romans is the light of creation. Second aspect of common grace that God has extended to all men is Romans chapter 2. That is the light of conscience. The light of conscience. Men innately know, because God has burned it into them, men innately know the difference between right and wrong. They know that it's wrong to murder. They know that it's wrong to steal. They know that when somebody takes something that belongs to them, they don't like it. <laughs> I mean, they're not all out there being generous and beneficial to everybody else. They'll sure steal whatever mine you want. Oh, yeah, you can kill me if you want to. They know there's something wrong with that. They know that immorality is wrong. That's why men in every culture, even if they're pagan cultures, fight for their wives and daughters. To protect them. There is the light of conscience. That's Romans chapter 2. When you get to Romans chapter 3, You've got special revelation. And there, in particular, it talks about the law of God. The law is that which condemns that which is unrighteous. The law is not made for your salvation. The law is not made for your sanctification. The law, as Paul says to Timothy, the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the unrighteous, for the ungodly, for sinners, for them to follow themselves with mankind, for whoremongers, uh, you know, if there be any other thing that's contrary to sound doctrine. And he goes through a whole litany of different things that it's made for. It's not made for the righteous man. You are not justified by the law. The law condemns. The law precisely condemns what is sin. It will not save you. But by extension, that special revelation would also include the gospel in the New Testament, which we are commanded to preach only to the elect. Is that right? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto the elect. Is that what it says? 
No. And to all the world. Does all the world mean all the world? Did you know that there are those in the Reformed circles, some of whom, not all, um, this is not true of Bible Presbyterians, but who say all the world means all the world of the elect. Okay. Folks, that is not what it says. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. We have a responsibility. Is that common grace? Yes. God actually making the gospel available to every tribe and tongue and nation. There are going to be people from every tribe and tongue and nation on the face of the earth in heaven. It says so in the book of Revelation. Have others heard? Yes. Have they rejected? Yes. Will they be in hell? Yes. But the gospel of Christ is being preached around the world. That was what Jesus gave them to do in the Great Commission. That's what he reinstated in Acts chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. That's what he told us to do and what we're supposed to be doing with our neighbors and our friends and the people around us who don't know Christ. That is God extending his grace. He's making an offer, a genuine offer. Now, we know they will not believe. You don't have to, you don't have to harp on that. I know that. I believe that. <clears throat> but he is extending grace to them even if they refuse it. What did Jesus say on the cross about the Pharisees, Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, the Roman soldiers who put the nails into his hands? Seven words. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He said that about the people who were crucifying him. Were all those people saved? Probably not. We'll know when we get to heaven which ones were and which ones weren't. We know that the centurion who watched that event said, truly, this was the Son of God. Did he come to faith in Christ? We don't know. We know that at the tomb, there were soldiers who saw the resurrection and saw the stone rolled away. Did they believe? We don't know. Some of them went back to the city and told the chief priests what had happened. That didn't sound like they're believing. And the chief priests certainly didn't believe because they said, look, we'll give you a lot of money. And the soldiers took the money. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we'll secure you. Just say that his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. Now, is that a believable story? A gigantic stone, probably eight feet tall and two feet thick, being rolled out of the way so silently that you don't wake up the soldiers who are lying down right next to it? I don't think so. But did they actually get to see what took place at the resurrection? That was the grace of God. Whether they believed or not, God gave them something that you and I didn't get to see. Whom having not seen, whom having not seen, you believe. Yes, there is special revelation that God gave. It's not like the mystery religions with a hidden and esoteric message, but it is to be indiscriminately broadcast to every human on the planet, even though they are dead and blind and in rebellion. But you see, the thing is, we don't know who the elect are, so we preach it to everyone. God didn't say, you'll be able to tell who the elect are because they'll all have purple polka dots on their forehead or a yellow stripe down their back. You know, I've heard people who believe like I do on many, many things, but they will not preach the gospel to anyone because they say we might be lying. They say we, we can never preach that Christ died for your sins because, you see, they don't believe that Jesus died for the sins of the world. They only believe that Jesus died for the sins of the elect. You know, that's it used to be called more popularly limited atonement. And now it's called particular redemption. You hear it. And that's why they won't witness. What they do instead is they say, well, we preach law and we preach sin 
and we preach judgment and then if the Holy Spirit works in their heart and we see that then we can say and they cry out for God to save them then we can know they're among the elect and then we can preach the gospel to them and tell them the good news that Christ died for them and was buried and rose again dear people I don't see that in the New Testament I don't see that in any of Paul's messages I don't see that in any of the presentations he made I don't see that in the doctrinal epistles whereby he says you can't preach the gospel until the people actually begin to cry out for mercy from God and then you know they're among the elect and then you can tell them that Christ died for their sins. Common grace is broadcasting it to everybody and some of them will reject it and God will call his elect from among those who reject it. Moving on. We don't know who the elect are, so we preach to everyone. Next uh, verse, verse 28. We're, hopefully we're going to get through this. The first part of the verse. For in him we live and move and have our being. <laughs> you know, that is probably the most obvious aspect of common grace, which is the sustenance of all human life. Not merely the lives of those who are the elect. In fact, You've probably noticed that oftentimes the non-elect live longer lives than the elect do. And you know, I think that's also a point of common grace and special mercy. That's God's mercy and grace to them in delaying the fires of hell. To let them live longer lives. Even though some of them are living longer lives because they're killing the Christians around them. And that's why the Christians are dying sooner than they do. 28b, second part of the verse. As certain also of your own poets have said. Now, I don't know if you picked up on this, but that tells you something about Paul. It's a fascinating insight into the education of Paul. He was not only trained as a rabbi in the scriptures and the very tedious, and believe me, it is tedious, and gigantic body of Jewish rabbinic studies, but he had also been trained in and had read extensively in the Greek culture, the Greek writings, the Greek poets, the Greek science, and the Greek philosophies. Paul knew something of the world around him. He was not isolated into one little tiny shell, although he protected himself within that shell, but he learned what was going on around him in all the rest of the world. Paul was observant. Remember we talked about that, being observant of your surroundings, of what's going on, who's doing what and what's happening. We talked about that as Paul was moving from city to city and observing certain things so he might witness to this particular group of people in a certain way so that he might understand the enemy is about to come around the corner. I think he'll go around the corner this kind of a way. Remember we talked about that? About him escaping and, and, and the way that they deployed the believers so that if there were spies out there they wouldn't know which group Paul had gone with uh, as though he were going to get on a ship and he didn't get on a ship, he walked instead. And I mean, lots of things out there Paul was observant. Paul knew what was going on, and Paul knew his culture. And Paul was capable of reaching his culture where they were. You know, Jesus did that. Jesus went to Samaria in John chapter 4. Jesus sat on a well of Samaria. He knew there was a certain woman that was coming. When she got there, he didn't just say to her, Woman, you should be convicted of your sins. You're a wicked, adulterous woman. You've lived with five men. The guy you've got right now is not your husband. He didn't start there, did he? He started with the common ground of things that she knew, things that she lived with, things that she did every day. And he actually put himself at her mercy. He said, give me to drink. The woman said, how is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a Samaritan? Ah, and Jesus gives us the example. Start with what they know. Start with their connection to the real world. And then take it to the spiritual realm. He says, if you knew who it was that asked you to give him a drink, you would ask of me for living water. Sir, you have nothing to draw from the well is deep. From whence then hast thou this water? Are you greater than our Father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. And Jesus moves from there into a water that springs up inside of you and gives you everlasting life. 
and the woman, still thinking in the physical realm, says, well, I'd like to have some of that water. Can you give it to me so that I won't have to come here? This is awful hot, sweaty work that I'm having to do here every day. And Jesus says, go call your husband. And the woman says, I have no husband. Ah. <laughs> now here's where the rubber meets the road. After he's got her attention, after he, she begins to realize that this man has something more to offer, Oh, what thou saidst, thou saidst truly. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. Whoa. So suddenly she switches to theology and discovers that he can beat her there in theology too. Hey, should we worship here or should we worship at Jerusalem? Jesus says, Day's coming when you'll neither worship in this place nor at Jerusalem. You worship in spirit and truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. I mean, he cuts through all of the garbage right up front and she runs and it says tells the men come and see a man who told me everything that I ever did and probably most of them were sweating it and thinking whoa everything she ever did I was in on part of that grace starting where they are Paul was able to start where they were a certain of your own poets have said first of all and look at this. Think about this for a moment. Paul is not merely making reference to a Greek poet. He's actually quoting a Greek poet. That means that he had memorized something other than the Bible and the Jewish interpretations from the Talmud, the Mishnah, uh, the Zohar, and other bodies of work that he sometimes cites. He doesn't cite the Zohar. But, but for example, if you've memorized Bible verses, how many of you in here have ever memorized at least one Bible verse? Okay. Everybody's memorized the Bible, at least one Bible verse, okay. If you've ever memorized Bible verses, have you ever, ever memorized any secular writers? Like secular poetry? You know, years ago, well, I'm glad to hear that. We have some amens up here in the front. Uh, years ago, I, had, I did have a large amount of uh, non-Christian poetry memorized. Um, among many others, I admit... Uh, memorize the midnight ride of Paul Revere. List my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere on the 18th of April, 75. Scarcely man is now alive who remembers that seven, uh, famous day in year. I think I got the day wrong, but anyway. Uh, or her uh, portions of Shakespeare, some of which I actually quoted to Judy as she was dying in my arms. Memorize the warrior of Japan. Very insightful poem. Definitely not Christian, but very insightful. I've memorized The Cremation of Sam McGee. How many of you have ever read The Cremation of Sam McGee? There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lake LaBarge. I cremated Sam McGee. <laughs> Robert W. Service. I'm not going to try to quote the whole poem. That was at least 40 years ago. <laughs> Closer to 50. <laughs> In fact, yeah, closer to 50. <laughs> but I can still remember most of it. You know, the things you memorize tend to stick with you, don't they? That's why we memorize scripture. Paul had memorized a Greek poet. In fact, a couple. I used to memorize poetry and dramatic readings because, you know, I discovered that those poems often had very interesting insights into human nature. Very, and that was from unsafe people. But they saw the problem. That goes back to the light of creation. That goes back to the light of conscience. That goes back to the knowledge that there is a right and there is a wrong. They had interesting insights into human nature and observations on the state of man and the creation that reflected an innate understanding that God has placed into man to make him accountable in the light of conscience. You see, common grace doesn't save the man, but it puts him accountable to God. So that nobody who stands before God can say, you know, hey, you didn't give me a chance. The second thing that we notice by reading that phrase there is that Paul is not quoting a major Greek poet. In fact, he's actually quoting two minor Greek poets. Aratus of Cilicia, about 270 BC when he lived, and Cleanthus, who lived about 300 BC, who has almost identical words. The Apostle Paul knew his stuff, and he knew his stuff in varied contexts, 
because everywhere he went, he was running into a different group of people with different kinds of background. But God had made Paul a diligent man who studied and understood the world around him and understood that there were certain things that people, through common grace, would know and he could use their own words against them. Dr. Henry Morris, the great creationist who really started the creation movement in the United States with John Whitcomb uh, and his book on uh, the flood of Noah years ago, um, he wrote a book entitled Their Words Against Them. It's a big, huge, fat book. Someplace in my library, I haven't seen it for the entire almost eight years that I've been here because it's been packed in a box. Uh, which I have not having had a library or any place to put my books have been stacked in that box for all this period of time but it's called their words against them and what it is he has meticulously read through all of the evolutionary scientists and all their best arguments and then he quotes from them demonstrating that they actually contradict each other their words against them that's what Paul is doing here. He knew what was going on around him. He didn't just have an opinion. He wasn't just belligerent. He wasn't just dramatic. The Apostle Paul knew his stuff. Third, this enabled Paul to engage the unbelieving pagans around him on their own turf and use the writings and words of the people whom they admired to use those words against them to prove his own points. If we want to be able to engage our culture, we need to be skilled in demonstrating the still visible vestiges of the truth that they have been trying to suppress. Because the unbeliever will suppress the truth. But there are things that squeeze through the cracks. It's like suppose you had a gigantic jello in front of you and it's four feet wide and the jello is tumbling toward you and you want to suppress it and hold it back and so you stick both your hands out there and you stick your head there and you stick your feet and your knees up there to suppress it is some of it going to leak through your fingers and around the sides is it yes it is the unregenerates try to suppress the truth but you know there's still stuff that leaks through and that's what Paul grabs onto that's what we need to learn to grab onto he engaged them with the, the still visible vestiges of the truth that they've been trying to suppress, but which still th show through their belief systems, through their premises, through their cultural norms. Those have all been corrupted by sin over the centuries. But as the Word of God tells us, God never leaves himself without a witness. Well, the last phrase, we're already over time, last phrase in verse 28, for we are also his offspring. That takes us back to God being the source of all life. And if they admit that, for as much then, verse 29, first part, then as we are the offspring of God, in other words, since you have admitted my premise through your own poets whom you believe, therefore you cannot deny my conclusions. Okay, since we're the offspring of God, last phrase, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. You're not made out of gold. You're not made out of silver. You're not made out of stone. You're not graven by art and man's device. You reflect God. Man was made in the image of God. And to this God you will someday give account. Do you understand what Paul's doing? General revelation in common grace. What God has given to all men so that if they would, though they will not and we know that, so that if they would, they have the opportunity to believe and that every mouth may be stopped and all the world be held accountable before God. That's how Paul ends Romans chapter 3. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for its power for the things we've learned tonight. Father, it's so easy to go to one extreme or the other. We pray that you'll give us a balanced Christian life, a balanced theology, the ability to see that there is truth that you have put out there that is available for all to see. Those who reject it are condemned by it, but nonetheless it is the truth, and it is visible, and they can, they can see and actually articulate the truth through their human senses, even if they reject it in their spirit. 
Father, we pray for your blessings upon us as we seek to engage our culture, as we seek to interact with unsaved people around us, as we seek to present them with the gospel of Christ, as we understand their background, their premises, the things that they believe, the things that they are deeply engaged in and that they are doing and might be able to see by your spirit within that some of these last vestiges of truth that we can point them to and say look you realize that this aspect of your life demonstrates that you are guilty it also demonstrates something about God and it tells me that you're someone who needs him father help us to be faithful in our testimony we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight.